So some history, probability theory began in the 17th century by Pierre de Fermat Les Pascal. Again, you can read these slides at home. Uh, when the uh, theoretical foundations were being laid out by Paul Mogorov, he made a connection between probability theory and the so-called measure theory. Uh, it's, here, about, it's about areas of probabilities, yeah? Exactly. Mm -hmm. But areas yes, are, I, I say, a particular case of uh, measure. Yeah. We can have sets, for example, with measure zero, but uh, we are looking nice to Anyway. Uh, da, printre altele, de exemplu, legate de teoria măsurii, sunt câteva teoreme foarte interesante în probabilitate, în uh, topologie, de fapt. De exemplu, ai o portocală, poți să tai în 8 mm. părți, astfel încât în acele 8 părți poți forma două portocale de aceeași dimensiune și nu o să fie poli. Inițial îți pare că e ceva fantastic, dar asta e măsură. Și simplu, mulțimile date nu sunt măsurate. Mm. În fine. So here are some applications of probability. Again, uh, you can read this at home. Beyond these engineering complications, there are some other daily problems which are solved by probability methods. Okay. So, consider a dice gameplay. This is the bad gameplay by uh, Chevalier de Mer. Uh, if you remember, the first year we discussed this game when he was making some bets on playing the dice. Again, uh, here is the example, but what you need to do, actually, it will be a good idea to compute, indeed, what are those probabilities, okay? So, probability with no six times up is five, six. Probability with no six times up on the first two tosses is five, six to power of two here. Four tosses, five, six to power of four. Again, we'll do this example uh, later, similar examples, but please check this at home. Anyway. So every probability problem involves some sort of randomized experiment. A randomized experiment is a game whose outcome you cannot predict at the beginning. So basically any probability problem, and that is the main idea you need to use every time when you will be trying to solve a probability problem is first of all translate your problem into mathematical language. So construct the situation from the point of view of mathematics. And after that, solve the resulting mathematical problems. So nothing difficult, basically. The difficult part is translation, actually. Anyway, so uh, we have two different types of probability. Actually, different is too much to say. Discrete probability, continuous probability. Now, uh, this uh, differentiation is basically made based on how many outcomes you have. If you have finitely many outcomes, or countably many outcomes, as many as natural numbers, this is discrete. If you have as many as real numbers, this is continuous probability. The notions, ideas lying behind both types are the same. Just formulas are slightly different. In one case, you will have sums. In another case, you will have integrals. But integral is nothing else but a sum in a limit. Anyway, so first consider chance experiment with a finite number of possible outcomes. Outcome means the possible result. So omega 1, omega 2, and so on, omega n. For example, rolling a die, you have six outcomes. Tossing a coin, you have two outcomes. Anyway, so it is frequently useful to be able to refer to an outcome of experiment. Anyway, uh, I'm uh, just moving what is important, for example, here. What are random variables? A random variable is a variable whose values are obtained from a random experiment. For example, x is the result after tossing a data. So x can take values 1, 2, 3, up to 6. Understand? This is a random variable. You can combine random variables. For example, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 is a new random variable. Okay? Where x1 is the result of the first toss, x2 is the result of the second, and so on. Anyway, so uh, here is again definition. Let me move. Again, you can read this at home. But now, to any probability experiment, to any random variable, you are putting into correspondence a special function, which is called distribution function. Distribution function is nothing else but the probability of each possible outcome. What is the necessary condition? The sum of the distribution function values on all possible outcomes should give you one. Okay. For example, 
we have here. If you are rolling a die, you have six outcomes, omega-1, omega-2, omega-3, and so on, omega-6. Which are numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, up to 6. To each number you are assigning the distribution function value. Now, since all faces are the same, the sum of all 6 should be 1. Since they are all the same, you have 6 times something equals 1. But something equals 1, 6. So, here you have the definition. Suppose we have an experiment whose outcome depends on chance. We represent the outcome by a capital Roman letter, which is called random variable. Sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. If the sample space is either finite or countably infinite, like natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, this is discrete. Sample space usually is denoted by omega. The elements of sample space are called outcomes. Each subset is called event. Example, a die is rolled once. Letter is denote the outcome of this experiment. Sample space contains six values for each possible outcome. An event, for example, can be two, four, six. In words, it will mean even result, number part. Okay? So event E is an outcome of sample space. Now, here is the distribution function defined. A distribution function for variable x is a function whose domain is omega and which has the properties. Distribution function is always positive. The sum of all possible outcomes gives you 1. Then, for any subset, probability of this subset will be what? The sum of all values in the subset. For example, again, die rolling, all values for all outcomes are 1, 6, the same. This is a distribution function, positive. The sum of 6 equals exactly 1. Now, E is 2, 4, 6. Then probability of E is M of 2 plus M of 4 plus M of 6. Which gives you, in the end, for example, 1 half. Here is another example. A coin is tossed twice. What is the sample space? So here sample space means result of two tosses. For example, head is 0 and tail is 1. Then you have basically either 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, or head, 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 tail, tail, head, tail, tail, clear? So you have four outcomes. All outcomes can happen with the same chances. The sum of all four should be 1. Therefore, the probability of just 1 will be 1 fourth. And here again is this explanation. By the way, the same problem can be modeled using a different sample space. For example, Someone else will say that sample space means 0, 1, 2, 0 means no heads, 1 means just one head, and 2 means two heads. But be careful, in this case, the probability will not have uniform distribution. Probability of 0 will be 1 fourth, probability of 2 will be 1 fourth, but probability of 1 will be 1 half, because here in 1 you have tail head, head tail. Clear? So be careful with defining the distribution functions. Yeah, here again this example continue. Uh, this is explained, for example, what is the probability that at least one head will be? Identify outcomes, head, 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 tail, tail, head. And then sum up and you will see the force. Okay, now for example, three people ABC are running for the same office election. And when you know that A and B have the same chance of winning. C has only one half chance of winning of A and B. So, M of A equals M of B, the same chance, and it is twice chance of C. The sum of all these should be 1. And then you can find what is M of C, for example. 2M of C plus 2M of C plus M of C equals 1, so probability of C winning is 1 fifth, then probability of A and probability of B will be 2 fifths. Yeah, and this is the simplest possible problem in probability. Now, for example, E is, but either A or C wins. E means AC, probability of E will be M of A plus M of C, which is 3 fifths. Clear? So once you have identified sample space, once you have identified your event, once you have identified distribution function, you can solve the problem related to this situation. Clear? Okay, here is the uh, set here again. I will not comment on this. You should know what is union, intersection, properties, complement, Venn diagrams. And here is the theorem which is very useful. 
Okay, and this should be known by you. Probability of any event is greater or equal than zero always. Probability of the whole sum of space is one. If E is a subset of F, then probability of E is smaller or equal than probability of F. If E and F are disjoint, probability of union is the sum of probability. Disjoint means no common points. Uh, empty intersection, no common points. And probability of negation is one minus probability of E. All these properties are very useful. Moreover, you can, for example, generalize this okay, to intersection not of two, but of several sets. For example, if set A1, A2, and so on are pairwise disjoint, so pairwise disjoint means that we are not intersecting, for example, in pairs. Moreover, triples, quadruples, and so on. So these are completely discrete sets. This, 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 we cannot have common points. Just some uh, that. Ah. Look, uh, intersection of three sets can be something like this, you see? So basically, if you write A1 intersect A2 intersect A3, it will be empty. But we are not pairwise disjoint. Clear? So basically, pairwise disjoint means that any combination of pairs, triples, and so on will give you empty set. Here, you have some intersection. Anyway. <coughs> if A1, A2, and so on are pairwise disjoint, then you have this. Anyway, uh, another theorem which is useful if these sets are pairwise disjoint such that union of this is the whole sum of space, then probability of any event is probability of the intersect probability of each set. Again, graphically, it's something like this. This is your sample space. This is A1. This is A2. This is A3. And for example, this is A4. The union of all four is the whole sample space. Moreover, we are not intersecting. Then you have set E. Then probability of E basically will be probability here, plus probability here, plus probability here, plus this one. Well, that's exactly what this theorem tells you. Yeah, probability is nothing else but the area of the set. So, uh, some corollary. Very useful sometimes. Probability of A is probability of A intersect B plus probability of A intersect not B. This is very useful sometimes to, in order to compute probability of A to divide it, it into, for example, sub-events. And here is another theorem. Probability of A union B for any sets is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of intersection. Now, a lot of problems in the discrete probabilities are easily solved if you construct the three diagrams. And my recommendation is understand how three diagrams work, because these three diagrams will make your life very easy while solving the discrete probability problem. For example, consider three choices of a coin. Now, if you have an experiment which can be divided into stages, it is a good idea to use three diagrams. Here we have three stages. First toss, second toss, third toss. Okay? So, you have stage one, and then you will write what? The outcomes, head to tail, then stage two, then stage three. And then, by the way, you can easily count what is the number of outcomes, what are those outcomes. For example, outcome omega four means head to tail tail. Then, to each branch, you will put the corresponding probabilities. Later I will explain what is, for example, probability here or here. These are nothing else but conditional probabilities. And in the end, we will multiply all probabilities to have probability of the final outcome. Again, we'll have some examples later with uh, the three diagrams. This is the easy case. Okay. Let me move faster. Yeah, so basically there are four basic steps in solving probability problem. Find sample space, define events of interest, determine outcome probability, so find distribution function, and then compute event probability. These are the four steps for 
for solving a probability problem. Here are the general situation. Here is the general situation. The set is a collection of objects with some property. Okay, here are example sets, empty set. Yeah, here what you should understand is the difference between, for example, this and this. Okay, uh, this set is, for example, the set containing element one. This one is the set containing a set which contains element one. So empty set is different from this, is different from this, is different from this. Uh, it's best to understand this, for example, something like this. Brackets means a box. So a box with nothing is different than just nothing. At least you have the box. This one, for example, is a box with a box and two nothings. If you want. Anyway. Yeah, uh, here are the definition of the set of all subsets. Okay. Again, I'm uh, leaving this for you to read. Yeah, here how two sets are being defined to be are uh, being proved to be the same. Uh, here are the operations, properties, and then here is a little bit of discussion about naive set theory, which uh, initially appeared and then gave rise to paradoxes like the Russell paradox or Barry's paradox or male barber paradox. Basically, this is the Russell paradox. The set X is X such that X is not a subset of, is not an element of itself. And then the question, X is in X or X is not in X. And basically, you will come up to a contradiction. Uh, how to solve it? Here is the barber paradox. Anyway, how to solve it? Introduce the universe set. The biggest possible set. And then once you are introducing universal set, all paradoxes disappear. Okay, so in other words, the correct definition of a set should be all objects with some big universal set with a given property. By the way, it is a nice exercise to check how Russell paradox is not happening if you have this definition instead of the previous one. Do it at home. Okay, now functions. Okay, so uh, we have function. Function is defined by the rule plus domain codomain. These are not functions because here, for example, the same element is mapped into two different elements. This is not a function because some element in here is not being mapped. Anyway, so when uh, the definition of bijective function, injective, subjective, here you have plenty of examples, so again go for these examples at home. But what is interesting in bijection, by the way, that's why, why we need it. If you have a bijection, if you want to can reorder the elements in here and your bijection will look like this. Basically now the uh, most important rule of bijection we'll be using is that if two sets are bijective, then they have the same number of elements. And we'll be using this in counting. Counting is very important in probability. Because basically you will have a set of all possible outcomes or the set of your event. And then you will need to count how many outcomes you have inside. Combinations, permutations, arrangements and so on. And the general principle of counting will be Translate this into a bijection problem. Find another set which you know how to count and show what where is a bijection. And then if a given set contains 20 elements, your initial set also will contain 20 elements. Okay? 